The year 1996 was a tragic one in the history of K2. The mountain was the scene of a grim tragedy that summer. It was a devastating season in K2 which resulted in a staggering 13 deaths. An avalanche on the magic line that caught two Americans started an incredible chain of accidents. The weather was not favorable and got worse from day to day. At the end, 13 mountaineers died. Some of them were never found. This is the story of one of the horrific disasters occurred on one of the world's most dangerous mountains. The summer on K2, named later the Black Summer, started with the deaths of John Smallage and Alan Finnington, members of an American expedition aiming to reach the summit via the then unclimbed Southwest Villa, also known as the Magic Line. They were killed in an avalanche on 21 June. The rest of the team left the mountain shortly after the accident. French couple borrowers reached the summit on 23 June shortly after their teammate Wanda Rutkiewicz became the postwoman to summit K2. They had to descend in the darkness. They made an emergency bivouac shelter not far from the summit along with other climbers. All made it through the night, but the French couple disappeared at some point during the descent. Polish climbers Erzo Kukuczka and Tadeusz Fiotrowski made it to the summit where the Ann climbed central rip of the south base on 10 July. Fiotrowski fell to his death during the descent where the uproots is far. On 16 July, Six days after the death of Yertrovsky, Italian soloist Renate Casarato fell into a crevasse on the Filippi Glacier after an unsuccessful attempt on the magic line. Although he was rescued from the crevasse, he succumbed to internal injuries sustained during the fall. A detailed video about Renato Casarato is available on my channel. You can find the link in the description. A strong Polish Slovakian team led by Janusz Meyer completed the first successful ascent of the magic line. On August 3, 1986, they reached the summit. They decided to descend by the Aprozi Road. At 8,100 meters, Uj Hros fell to his death. The next day, on 4 August, Sardar of a South Korean expedition, Muhammad Ali from Pakistan, was killed by falling rocks on the Aprozi Road. There were two foolish teams in Ketu in 1986, led by Janusz Meyer and Erzak Kuchka. Both teams reached the summit via two new routes, the Magic Line and the Polish Line. Dobroslava Medvedev Wolf, also from Poland, However, decided to climb K2 through Abruzzi Spur in a team with Alan Rose, a leader of the British expedition. Earlier, Rose's team was struggling to summit via the typical Northwest Ridge. After several unsuccessful attempts on the Northwest Ridge, the team dispersed, leaving only Rose and cameraman Jim Curran on the mountain. Curran returned to base game, but Rose chose to continue his summit bid. Other expeditions were also facing difficulties that summer and K2. They were trying different routes on the mountain. Despite difficulties and disbandment, they all formed together a combined team of seven climbers, including Austrians, Olpert's Emitzer, Hans Wieser, Willy Wauer and Kurt Dimburger, British Alan Rose, Julie Tallis, and Polish Dobroslava Medvedev Wolf. They wanted to summit via the conventional route without a format. The newly formed team eventually made it to Camp 4, last camp before the summit. They decided to wait a day before making a summit push. On 4 August, despite bad weather, 
Rose and Wolf started for the summit at 5.30 a.m. Followed by Emirza alone, then Julie Tallis and Dimberger, and finally Bauer and Wieser. Wieser turned back after 100 meters, fearing first wide because of damn meters. Rose broke trail to within 100 meters of the summit, where Bauer took over. Rose fell in behind the Austrians. Bava and Emirza reached the top at 3.30 p.m. On the way down to Camp 4, they first met Rose and then Wolf, who was exhausted and asleep in the snow at 8,500 meters. Bauer told her to turn back because it was too late and the weather was getting worse. But she was unmoved. Rose made it to the summit at 4 p.m. and became the first Englishman to reach Kato's summit. On the descent, he convinced Wolf to turn back. In 1984, she had turned back before the very top and Nangafarvat as well. Good Dimberger and Julie Tallis reached the top at 5.30 p.m. On the descent, Dimberger was leading the rope when Tully slipped, pulling him down the slope for about 100 meters. Though not seriously hurt, they had to spend the night in the oven at an altitude of about 8,400 meters. Although a severe storm had begun further on the mountain, they all finally reached Camp 4 and a whiteout the next morning on 5 August and joined Hans Wiesa who had stayed behind. They waited for the storm to relent, but instead it worsened, bringing heavy snowfall, winds were 160 km per hour and sub-zero temperatures. They all were trapped high in the mountain in the dead zone. According to Anna Cherwinska, the blizzard was like a shark's mouth. At one point, it closed up and imprisoned everyone. Dimberger and Tullis had to abandon their tiny tent, which kept being drifted over with snow. Dimberger joined Rose and Tullis went in with the Austrians. She was weakened, lost her vision, and finally died peacefully in her sleep on August 7th presumably of high-altitude pulmonary edema. On 8 August, they ran out of food and fuel and could no longer melt snow into water. They were in imminent danger and remained barely conscious. On 10 August, it stopped snowing, but the wind was still at gale force. Dimberger and Wolf tried in vain to get roused up, he was hallucinating a near death. Though weak and severely dehydrated, the remaining climbers left Alan Rose in his tent and decided to descend to save their own lives. It was a decision for which the survivors, particularly Dimburger, was severely criticized. Jim Curran, cameraman of Rose's British expedition, depended Dimberger. According to Curran, there was absolutely no way that either Dimberger or Bava could have gotten Rouse of the mountain alive. Bava stirred his companions Wieser and Emirza into descending with him and Wolf. But Wieser and Emirza were snow blinded and so weak that a short distance of below came four, both collapsed and died. Dimberger started his descent alone half an hour later and joined Bava and Wolf down the slope. Bava did most of the trail breaking in the deep snow. Wolf also helped with faming. She pulled out Bava when he collapsed in the snow. Camp 3 had been swept away by the storm. Bava sharply criticized Dimberger for not helping. Dim should be paving too, Wolf told Bauer. Finally, they found a seric below which were fixed roofs. 
they had to free the ropes from under the snow. Ulub then began to have descending problems. The rope that had to pass through the metal figure of eight was thick, hard and frozen. Ulb had difficulty pulling it through the device, especially since the fingers were frozen to the bone, hidden in thick gloves. From there, they each went down separately. On 10 August, at around 9 pm, Bauer got to camp too, where he finally melt snow and ate something. Dimberger arrived at 10 pm. Ulp never reached camp too. They waited for her until noon before descending to the first house chimney. Power went on ahead to base camp and alerted a rescue crew. Dimberger reached at once base camp at midnight where he met the rescuers who brought him down to base camp. Michael Mesna and Shamizwa Fisaski climbed back up to 7,100 meters but found no sign of wolf. Both Bawa and Dimberger were badly frostbitten and were helicoptered out from the base camp on 16 August. Both lost multiple fingers and toes as a result of severe first bite. Ulp, who was descending last, never made it back. She was exhausted, frostbitten, and froze to death only 200 meters away from where Wanda Rodkiewicz's tent was located. A year later, members of a Japanese expedition found her attached to the fixed ropes, still standing upright and leaning against the wall. Dimberger was considered by Wolf's family for a year as the one who left her. According to them, Wolf helped others, while Dimberger only cared about himself. Bohr, in a conversation with his colleagues, pointed out that during the six days in Camp 4, he proposed an earlier descent several times, but he always encountered resistance. Only Wolf was on his side. According to Bauer, Kurt Dimberger was in the worst shape of them all. They were dying fearful, fearful in agony. They stayed at 8,000 meters in the death zone for a week. Never before or since have climbers been for so long and survived. Thank you all so much for watching this video. And if you enjoyed it, please leave a like and a comment below. If you wanna watch more content like this in the future, please consider subscribing to the channel as there is much more yet to come.